Hello, I'm Joanna Grace. I run the Sensory Projects and I'm also the author of this book, Multiple Multisensory Rooms, Myth Busting the Magic, which is published by Rootledge. I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about the presence of sensory rooms in heritage settings. Um, and in particular, I was asked to talk about the difference between a sensory room and a quiet room. Now, I know lots of places are looking to be more inclusive, which is wonderful. And one of the ways that they're looking to do this is by creating a sensory space within their their place. So these could be a sensory room, it could be a chill out room, it could be a quiet space. And quite often there is confusion around those spaces because the understanding of what they're for or who they're for can get muddled. So for example, a sensory room can be a good place to chill out, it can be a good quiet space, but only if everybody in there is being quiet and chilled out. Oftentimes, sensory rooms are used to be engaging, exciting, interesting spaces, and the two can't coexist. And so if you are creating a space, you need to think who it's for and what it's for in their context, you know, what are they going to be doing with it? And I'm, the reason I'm stumbling over my words is because I'm thinking, I've just put the book on the floor, but I'm thinking about um, a little diagram that's in here and I'll show it to you only because it amuses me because when I was talking to Rutledge about putting this diagram in the book, I was saying, could you make something like this? And he actually printed my own little scribbles that I sent. So this is my hand-drawn diagram. There is this idea that a sensory room is a thing. You know, I've drawn just a cube. But actually, there are lots of different types of sensory rooms. So like there's dark rooms, there's immersive rooms, there's white rooms, there's calming rooms. So if you imagine you slice that cube up into sort of you know, like half a dozen pieces, then you've got a load of different types. And actually, there are different groups of people who might have cause to use those rooms and they would all need different things from it. So for example, you might have autistic people or people with profound disabilities. So imagine chopping that cube up again in a different direction. Now you've got even more bits. And then the companies that install these rooms or the all do it in very different ways so that creates another set of slices and then if you think about the different philosophies that underpin these rooms that's another set of slices so there isn't really a choice between a sensory room and a quiet room there is a reason the book is called multiple multi-sensory rooms there is so many things that you can do so you want to think about what it is that you want to do and you need to recognise that you can't do all of the things at once. If you try and do them all on top of each other, you stop them all from working. I would imagine that what most places need is a getaway space for people who are finding the environment too much. And that doesn't have to be a super fancy space. That can just be a piece of information in your guidebook that says, if you would like to sit in the room on the second floor and just chill out for a bit, that's fine. That room is designated as a quiet space. We've made sure that it's not near a load of Dyson Airblade hand dryers and it doesn't have fumes from the cafe being pumped into it. You know, we've picked a good room for it. If you want a room that's going to engage people in a fantasy landscape, you know, if you want them to travel back in time and experience a battlefield, then an immersive room with all the projection is going to be great. But that room isn't necessarily going to be accessible to, for example, somebody with a visual impairment because the amount of lumens required to create that sort of fantasy world is so so bright that if you haven't got the visual processing capacity to take it you're just in a whiteout space and so you can see as I talk it's all these different permutations but the crux of it is think about who it's for and what it's for what they want from it and follow that as your sort of guiding principle rather than looking through glossy brochures and going whoa that looks lovely, we need one of them, don't know what for. Think about who and think about why and tell in your information those things. This is for these people and this is why. This is what we hope you'll get from it. And then hopefully you marry up your who and why with the people accessing it and you provide the support that you hope to provide. And do get in touch with me because I realise that probably all sounds very muddled. I'm very happy to chat more about it. Bye.